previously on the first three parts of my Cochise County Special. Starting in the northern end of the Dragoon Mountains, I spent the first day of my trip visiting the old Butterfield Stage Station and camping out in the incredible Cochise Stronghold. The following day, I crossed the Sulphur Springs Valley to visit the ruins of Camp Rucker, before returning to Middlemarch Pass to camp at the aptly named Middlemarch Mine. Yesterday, I spent much of the day touring the ruins of Cortland, a former copper mining town with several buildings and current preservation efforts underway. I also made a quick stop in Gleason before looping through Tombstone to the western part of the Dragoons, camping out in a rugged and incredibly scenic area. Today, on the final day and a half of my trip, I'll head west of Tombstone to the San Pedro River Valley. I'll spend much of the day on foot, first visiting Brunkow's cabin, allegedly the bloodiest cabin in Arizona history. Later, I'll visit the remains of Charleston and Millville, the milling towns that supported the boom of nearby Tombstone. After spending the night in a historic hotel, I'll wrap up my trip by visiting the ghost town of Fairbank, just downstream along the San Pedro. After a little bit of a late night last night, I took the opportunity to sleep in. It was a little after 9 when I woke up, and I stayed up in the tent for some time, looking out at the view, which was still just as incredible this morning. The sheer rock faces of the rugged dragoons caught the light as the sun continued to rise. Last night, there had been a slight chill in the air, but it was more mild than the prior night. The wind had also been exceptionally calm throughout the trip, which made things that much more enjoyable. I enjoyed the views for some time. It didn't matter which direction I looked because it was all stunning. Eventually, I got up and around. Of course, getting breakfast going was the first order of business. Today would be a couple of eggs, as well as the obligatory oatmeal and cup of coffee. Everything cooked up quick, and I sat up in the tent to eat. After a little more downtime, it was time to start breaking down camp. I did have quite a few stops planned for today, so it was time to get going. After getting camp buttoned up and all my gear packed away, I added a little extra water to the campfire to make sure it was cool to the touch. Packing up camp usually takes about half an hour depending on how much rearranging I need to do, and today was no different. A little after 10.30, I was firing up the jeep and ready to get back on the trail out. This campsite had been really great. While definitely a busy area, there are still plenty of places to find some seclusion, and the views are good just about anywhere you pick. I definitely hope to return to this area in the future and spend some more time. I returned to Forest Road 687 and headed back south towards Middlemarch Road. The trail out, as mentioned before, is pretty easy going. It's mostly hard packed dirt with short sections of sand, washouts, and some occasional rocks. While I did see some cars, depending on how far back you plan on going, high clearance wouldn't be a bad idea. And of course, these conditions can change with one good rain. I continued south along the western edge of the Dragoons, enjoying the changing scenery and impressive views. Eventually, the road climbed, crossed the cattle guard, and turned right to rejoin Middlemarch Road back towards Tombstone. From here, the road remained incredibly wide and fast moving. The road has some typical washboards, but is very easy going. Partway down the road, I found myself yielding to air traffic, which is not something you say every day. A DPS helicopter was flying low through the area and appeared to land on the dirt road up ahead. Not a great sign. I eventually made my way closer and found Cochise County Search and Rescue hard at work. 
I don't know the full details, but they did find a lost and disoriented hiker who was airlifted out of the area. The road was uneventful the rest of the way back to Highway 80. Most of my stops today were west of Tombstone along Charleston Road, so I continued through town. I'd be staying the night in Tombstone, and having been there several times already, would have more time later to explore town a bit. Nine miles past Tombstone, I turned off on a small dirt road marked Brunkow Road. I parked at a small clearing underneath the power lines as the road was marked closed and private property not far past this. My goal was to hike the rest of the way to Brunkow's cabin, a historic structure with a bloody and rich past. From the parking area, I could just make out some ruins on a nearby hill a little less than half a mile away. There isn't really an easy or official way to get to it, as you have to park somewhere near the highway and find the rest of your way on foot. And this place seemed like the best starting point. I set off southwest with my camera and some water, aiming for the cabin. There was a fairly well-defined footpath that I followed, although some areas were a little overgrown with some thorny bushes. Not far down the path, I came across some intriguing foundations. A pretty impressive structure, likely related to mining, stood here at one point, although little remains today. I continued hiking down the trail, slowly descending towards a wash. As I was hiking, I enjoyed some more low-flying airplanes from nearby Sierra Vista, which seems to have become a recurring theme on this trip. I crossed the wash and could see the cabin on a small hill just up ahead. I crested the hill and came to a small adobe building and historic marker. This was Brunkow's cabin. Little actually remains of the cabin, which was built on site in 1858 by Frederick Brunkow. Frederick was born in Germany in 1830 and emigrated to the US in 1850. He worked for the Sonora Exploring and Mining Company, but quit that job in 1858 to start his own mining operation. Called the San Pedro Mine, Brunkow soon built a small store for supplies and a cabin for sleeping near the mine. The cabin remains quite deteriorated, with several walls knocked down and a few bullet holes. The simple structure was made of adobe bricks, some concrete, and at one point had a tin roof. The real fame and lore for this cabin, however, comes from its checkered past. By 1860, Frederick and his San Pedro mine were operating in the hills surrounding the cabin. John Moss, a chemist, David Brontrager, a German cook, and two miners named James and William Williams oversaw the property alongside Brunkow. Mexican labor was used in the mining operations. In July 1860, William Williams left for Fort Buchanan to resupply, and when he returned just three days later, found a grisly scene. He found his cousin James dead and immediately ran back to the fort. William and the soldiers returned the following day to find Moss dead outside the cabin and Brunkow brutally murdered with a rock drill. The store had been ransacked and the company's horses and $3,000 worth of goods were stolen. Braun Drager was missing but was later found near the Mexican border released by the attackers for being a, quote, good Catholic. The three men left dead were buried on site. Over a decade later, a property dispute claimed another life at the cabin. Milton Duffield, the first U.S. Marshal appointed to the Arizona Territory, had purchased the cabin and mining claims. Duffield was known to be erratic and carry up to 11 guns at a time. When going to evict a man living in his cabin, who had apparently heard about Duffield's reputation, came out the front door with a shotgun and killed Milton, only to find out he was apparently unarmed. Perhaps the most notable resident of the cabin was a prospector named Ed Schieflin. After departing Camp Huachuca to search for riches in 1877, Schieflin created a permanent base camp at Brunkow's cabin. Alongside his brother Al and fellow prospector Richard Gerd, who would later go on to work at the Middlemarch Mine and have tremendous success at the nearby Millville operation, the trio explored the area for a few weeks. 
The area at the time was incredibly hostile, with the Apache frequently attacking settlers throughout the area. Schieflin allegedly used the fireplace of the cabin to assay his silver ore samples, and was encouraged by Brunkow's operation at the San Pedro mine to continue northeast to explore some rocky outcrops. This is of course the area where Tombstone sits, and the incredible boom that would follow in the subsequent years. It is unclear what happened to the property following Schieflin's departure to bigger and better things, but a Prescott newspaper later reported an additional 17 others were killed at the cabin in the decades since. Gang shootouts, Apache attacks, and a variety of other reasons were cited for the deaths. However, it remains unclear just how many actually happened and how many were simply local legends. Although there wasn't much to look at, there was a ton of history to be explored here at Brunkow's cabin. I turned back around and headed back the four-tenths of a mile back towards the jeep. Back at the paved road, my next few stops were just a bit further west. From here, the drive quickly dropped into the San Pedro River Valley. Just before the river crossing, I parked at an overlook to check out the view and another historical marker. While most people might consider the San Pedro little more than a stream, it is unique in the fact that it actually flows north. Beginning in Mexico and flowing 140 miles north, it eventually joins the Gila River just outside Winkleman. This water source has long been used by people traveling through the area over the last 10,000 years. Today, it remains the last undammed river in the southwest and hosts two-thirds of the bird diversity in the entire United States. Its tranquil and shady banks made for a nice, relaxing break. Two bridges cross overhead, one carrying modern-day traffic, while the older one is open to foot traffic. This bridge is also home to a large collection of locks that people apparently place here for symbolic reasons. A small stone marker sits just above the river bottom, although it has seen better days. This marks the location of the Battle of the Bulls, an 1846 skirmish that occurred along the San Pedro. The Mormon Battalion, a group of 500 volunteers, serving in what is the only unit in US military history to be made up of a single religion, was camped here on their 2,000 mile journey to San Diego. Some wild cattle were attracted to camp, and a stampede followed. Two to three men were wounded, and over ten bulls were killed in this unusual battle. After enjoying the view for a while, I briefly returned to the paved road and headed for my next stop. Just a third of a mile down the road, I turned off into another parking area. This was one of the many trailheads on the Sky Island Traverse, and I would be using it today to head for the ghost towns of Millville and Charleston. It was about a mile and a half round trip to the ruins, and several other trails and historic sites also dot the nearby area along the San Pedro. The trail here was more well defined than the one to Brunkow's cabin. Up ahead on a hill were the stacked stone foundations of the old Millville operation. Definitely earning our beers today. Been a pretty uh, active day, a little more hiking than normal, but some of these places are only accessible via hiking trails. So I guess it's worth the effort. After crossing a wash and continuing uphill, I soon arrived at the old town site. In the most simplest terms, Millville existed because of water. Ore from the mines in Tombstone needed to be processed, and milling on site was too costly at first. After striking it rich, Ed and Al Schieflin, alongside Richard Gerd, established a 10-stamp mill on the banks of the San Pedro that began operation in June 1879. The ore was hauled 9 miles by mule train from Tombstone. By 1880, another mill was opened, developed by the Corbin Mill and Mining Company. In order to support the nearly 24-7 operation, a town site popped up across the river and was called Charleston. Home to up to 400 people at its peak, the town featured a school, restaurants, stores, and other modern amenities. During its peak in 1881, 
Melville churned out $1.3 million in silver bullion that year alone. Life in town was often over-exaggerated, being called tougher and livelier than Tombstone at one point. However, in 1886, the mines of Tombstone flooded, and the water problem that necessitated the creation of Millville suddenly wasn't an issue anymore. The Gerd Mill was moved into Tombstone proper to refine ore on site, while the Corbin Mill was left to process whatever remained at Millville. By 1889, both Charleston and Millville were completely abandoned, as were many of the other mills that lined the San Pedro. Today, surprisingly little remains at Millville. Unfortunately, a lot of the ruins that were left behind in town have been picked through and looted, perhaps because it sat abandoned in a busy location for so long. The most impressive thing is the several stacked rock foundations of where the two former mills once sat. The outline of Richard Gerd's house, which also served as the Tombstone Mill and Mining Company offices, also remain. A few random scraps, old trash, and slag piles remain scattered around along with several interesting information boards with historic photos. Plenty of well-marked hiking trails are available to further explore the area on what's called the Sky Island Traverse, a trail system connecting multiple sites up and down the river. Across the San Pedro, Charleston, which was once connected by bridge to Millville, has all but been decimated. The area was used for training during World War II by soldiers from Fort Huachuca. Even today, the BLM advises against visiting the area. From Millville, I returned back the way I came, on the hiking trail. Overall, it was about a mile and a half from the parking area to the old ruins and back. But as mentioned, you can easily add on to that by continuing along the San Pedro along the old railroad bed, which accesses sites like Contention, the old Clanton Ranch, and Fairbank, which I would visit tomorrow. Back on pavement, I aimed back east and continued the nine miles back into Tombstone. It was about 4 o'clock, and this would allow me to get to my stop for the night and have some downtime in town. After a quick cruise through historic Tombstone, I was soon arriving at my overnight accommodations, a historic hotel called the San Jose House. Located just a block away from Allen Street and the OK Corral, this would be the perfect location to walk around town. The building was built in 1879, in the early days of the massive boom that took place, and is a National Historic Landmark. With only three rooms, I'd be staying in the Doc Holiday Suite. Inside was a large living room, kitchenette area, back bedroom, and bathroom. I quickly got my gear inside and freshened up, which after four days and three nights of camping was a much welcomed relief. All right, we've made it to Tombstone, night four of our trip. Now, a little bit different accommodations from what I usually do. This is the last night of my trip. I figured I wanted to do something kind of historic. It was built in 1879 when Tombstone was booming and some of the Wild West legends were roaming the streets. Now, apparently, according to them, people like Wyatt Earp, Josephine Marcus, Doc Holliday all stayed in this building. Um, I'm actually in the Doc Holliday room right now. So it's kind of cool to be sleeping under the same roof as some of those greats. A little bit of a different night, but Never had the opportunity to stay like this in Tombstone within walking distance of everything. So it should be a lot of fun. So I'm gonna head out for the brewery now, grab a drink and see where we end up from there. From the San Jose house, I walked through historic downtown. There is a lot to see if you've never been, such as the OK Corral, the Birdcage Theater, the old courthouse, and even a mine tour. I soon made it to my destination, Tombstone Brewing. A place I've been a fan of for a couple years, but never had the chance to actually visit until now. It's a small building, but they do have a rotating tap selection and about 30 different canned varieties to try, which for purely scientific purposes, I had to try a couple out. As expected, they were pretty darn good and much appreciated after a busy day hiking around. I grabbed some dinner at one of the old saloons and retreated back to my room to settle in for a relaxing night. After a restful night and sleeping in the next morning, it was time to get moving once again. This stopover in Tombstone ended up being really enjoyable and relaxing. 
This historic building was a nice, quaint location I'd like to return to in the future. Morning, day number five. Crazy to think how fast this week flew by, but it's been a great time. So last night was really fun here in Tombstone, just being able to walk the streets for a little bit, grab some drinks, grab some food at uh, Tombstone Brewing and Crystal Palace Saloon downtown, and then being able to walk just right back here uh, relax and lounge for a bit and then uh, turn in and get a decent amount of sleep and uh, feeling good this morning so I'm gonna get going on cleaning this up and we can get back on the road and do a couple more stops after getting my gear packed back up in the Jeep it was time to head for my two final stops for this trip the first of which was a monument just outside of town I weaved through the streets of Tombstone, eventually continuing west on dirt residential roads. Past the official cemetery, not to be confused with Boot Hill, the road climbed into some rocky hills. Here, a large stone monument remains, marking the resting place of the founder of Tombstone himself, Ed Schieflin. The son of a miner, Ed spent 20 years prospecting before returning to, quote, normal life after striking out. He returned back to prospecting after 18 months, commenting that, quote, he was no better off than when I was prospecting and not half as well satisfied. He chased his dream and took a risk, returning to the Huachuca Mountains and eventually finding his way east to the riches that would become Tombstone. He died in 1897 at 49 years old and was buried here. His wishes were to be buried in his miner's garb alongside a pick and canteen underneath a marker resembling a mining claim marker. As it turned out, the marker was just a bit bigger than he probably would have liked. Overlooking the town he helped create, the gravesite today is a quiet spot to take in the view and think about all the people that have journeyed this way before me. Back on the highway now, I set my sights north. My last stop of the trip was just 20 minutes northwest of Tombstone. I followed the paved road, heading back into the San Pedro River Valley, where I soon turned off at the ghost town of Fairbank. I grabbed a quick bite to eat before heading to Main Street to check out the buildings left behind today. First called Kendall, Fairbank began life as a stagecoach stop on the way to Tombstone. Later known as Junction City, the town that stood here quickly grew in 1882 as the mines in the area boomed and a railroad was built. The town was renamed Fairbank after a Chicago grain broker named Nathaniel Kellogg Fairbank who helped finance the new New Mexico and Arizona Railroad which connected Benson and Nogales. Fairbank also organized the Grand Central Mining Company in Tombstone, which operated a mill north of here. Due to its proximity to Tombstone, Fairbank became the stopping point for travelers moving in and out of town. In fact, Fairbank became the supply depot and last stop for all Tombstone-bound passengers and freight. By 1888, Fairbank was home to four stores, three restaurants, five saloons, a hotel, school and post office. The railroad connections were expanded and at its peak held a depot for three different railroads that connected all of the nearby towns. Like other boom towns, Fairbank had its fair share of violence, but the most notable incident occurred in February of 1900. A gang attempted to hold up and rob the Wells Fargo strong box as a train rolled into town. Jeff Milton was guarding the car and fatally shot one of the five attempted robbers. Milton was shot in the arm in the process, but managed to throw the key into the brush, preventing the bandits from making off with anything. The population peaked in 1890 with around 500 people, but slowly dwindled after that. The building of Highway 82 in 1936 allowed Fairbank to survive as a stopover for people heading other places. but. In 1960, when the last rail depot closed, Fairbank was all but a ghost town. The old railroad bed remains today as it runs along the San Pedro. The town held on until the 1970s, but was soon abandoned altogether. Today, 
several buildings remain well preserved. The schoolhouse, rebuilt here in 1920, is one of the best on site. It features gypsum blocks on the outside and during most times is home to the museum and gift shop on the inside. The school was open until the 1940s and offered 1st through 7th grade, with 8th grade taking place down the road in Tombstone. A few wooden houses remain scattered around, but are closed to entry. Another impressive building is the old Fairbank Commercial Company building, a large adobe structure that housed the town general store, saloon, town jail, and post office. This building has been stabilized by the BLM who saved it from falling into complete disrepair. Most of the other buildings have been destroyed or removed, but it is still neat to stroll down Main Street and imagine what life would have been like in this busy railroad town. Having checked out most of the remnants, it was time for me to start heading back to the Jeep. I had a three hour drive back home to get to and my time in Cochise County was unfortunately winding down. I headed back for the highway, crossed the San Pedro, and made my way back towards I-10. I got one last view of the Dragoons across the valley as my incredible trip came to an end. My five days in Cochise County had truly been incredible. Around every bend was something to explore or check out, and the combination of big views along the way only made it that much more special. While my campsites were focused around the rugged Dragoon Mountains, I got the chance to explore some of the many ghost towns, old mining camps, and historic sites scattered around. From Dragoon Springs Stage Station to Camp Rucker, Ringo's Gravesite to the Middlemarch Mine, and of course the once boom towns of Cortland and Gleason, not to mention Tombstone, Millville, Fairbank, and even Brunkow's Cabin, everywhere I turned, there was a remnant of the past. My time in Cochise County was well spent, and absolutely flew by. I do appreciate you watching this special, and subscribing if you'd like to see more. You can head over to our website for more information on the trails and places featured in this video. We'll be back with more trips, historic spots, and vehicle projects in the future, and as always, we'll see you on the next one.